is useful, that it does give you dividends. Daniel Ben Simon, do you agree? Uh, yes, I think uh, the gentleman is right. And, and I, if you allow me, I, I want, if you heard Netanyahu's speech, he said today something that he never said before. And he invited the Palestinian president to speak at the Knesset. And he invited himself to speak in Ramallah. This is the first time that Netanyahu invited, made such invitation. I think it's dramatic. It can become spectacular because with Begin and Sadat, it started exactly the same. And a speech when, when Begin invited Sadat, Sadat took, the, took you know, the invitation and came to Jerusalem. I hope this invitation, which is the first, can be taken seriously. And of course, it's done in the context of Kerry coming on Friday, of the talks about Iran. Maybe. But if Abu Mazen is uh, audacious enough to take this invitation and set a date to come to the Knesset, I will tell you, it will be a revolution in terms of Israeli politics. It will have the same impact that uh, Sadat's trip to Jerusalem. The presence of Abu Mazen in the Israeli parliament can change all the politics between right and left. And that's why, I'm, I'm, I mean, if any Palestinian is watching us, please take this invitation seriously. Uh, uh, coming from Netanyahu, of course, the Likud will not remain the Likud. The right wing will not remain the right wing. Everything will change. It, just the coming of Abu Mazen to the parliament will, will, will be a total uh, uh, set of cards in Israeli politics. And that's something he said tonight. And I wish you will take over this and maybe do something with it, because it's very, very important. D Daniel, don't you think you've been somewhat optimistic? Because at the end of the day, the stumbling block is and continues to be Israeli settlement construction. I mean, I think while Israel continues to build those homes in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, that the odds of uh, Mahmoud Abbas turning up to uh, speak to the Israeli Knesset are fairly low at the moment. I know, I know, but I have to. I live here, Annette. I I have to be optimistic. I cannot make you know depression mm -hmm. uh, something of a, of a, mm -hmm. you know profession. I have to believe, and something has to be done because we are stuck. We are stuck. Nothing has been done in the last twenty years, and and I'm looking for new ideas, revolutionary ideas, because we are in a total status quo. We are building settlements. The Palestinians are angry. They are angry. We are building. They are killing us. We are killing them. Nothing is moving ahead. And what I'm saying, there was something said tonight. Let's take Netanyahu by his word and do something out of reality. So that, of course, I'm too optimistic. Of course, it has a very low success. But you have to believe in something. You have to have a vision to do something, to be a leader and not wait until time does you well or, or for you, the Israelis or the Palestinians. Uh, Samuel, as you know, uh, a newsroom can be kind of a cynical place. And when, when we heard that the Israeli prime minister had said that, there was a bit of, well, Annette described it, uh, people thinking, is this a diversion? How could it happen as long as settlement building is going on? Some even saying that um, could this be in some way linked to the other dossier that we're talking about, which is Iran? Well, I mean, the, there is an ongoing debate about Netanyahu. What does he want and what is, what is he ready to do? I mean, this debate is, is, is in the air since 2009 and since the, the speech he gave at the uh, Bar-Ilan Bar University saying that he was in, in favor of the two-state solution. And there was the question, is he ready to make a deal? What are the compromises that he's ready uh, to make when it comes to the land? And maybe Daniel Ben Simon, I, I would be happy if the optimism of Daniel Ben Simon is going to be shared in the Israeli society. And if indeed Abu Mazen is going to talk at the uh, Israeli parliament, we don't know. Some people can change. Ariel Sharon managed to change yes, and to day, make some modifications. The, the, the other day, the negotiating team of the Palestinians resigned in fury over the fact that Israel continues to build homes in the, uh, in the occupied territories. Sean Meyer. Yeah. yeah. Um, I already said that the construction is not the problem. What is the problem? It's very simple. When two heads of states want to make peace, they first have to make peace between their population. 
and not and not have a speech of hatred. This is uh, one of the points. Is that a criticism that can be leveled on it's, both sides? It's it's uh, mainly a criticism against Mahmoud Abbas. What is taught to the children, the children are taught hatred. Uh, they deny the existence of an Israeli state. But it's not the, the point I want to mention. I want to remind here that since 1947, all the Israeli governments, right or left, including Bibi Netanyahu, including Lieberman, who is considered like, like uh, uh, somebody uh, fundamentalist, uh, every Israeli government accepted the principle of sharing. And the Palestinian never accept the principle of sharing. Right, well, we, 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 if they would accept the principle of sharing, they would have set up a country from the beginning like the Jewish population did. All right, we, we, this we, is a very problem. We, the problem is the acceptance of a Jewish state. Okay, we could, we, could, we could go back over that. We did talk about it in part one of our discussion, this issue. I want to get back, though, to this issue of Iran. Because yes. there's this talk in, in, in Israel, uh, this very real sense that there's an existential threat to the state of Israel coming not from the Palestinians, uh, but from the Iranians. And on that score, if you're just joining us, speaking before the Knesset, the French president said that uh, he would uh, not let Iran get the bomb. And we mm -hmm. talked about how um, the uh, uh, French last week balked at signing on the dotted line. Will France stay the course in Geneva? Here's what François Hollande spelled out for, as his conditions for signing. This at a joint press conference with the Israeli prime minister. France is in favor of an interim deal, but only if it's based on the four major issues we have selected as our main demands to Iran. First, the international community must immediately take control of all of Iran's nuclear installations. Second, Iran should stop enriching plutonium to 20 percent. Third, we should reduce the amount of plutonium Iran has stocked. And last, the construction of the Iraq nuclear plant must stop. Uh, Ruzbe Parsi, uh, when you read, that's a pretty long list there. Uh, is any, is, is, does this mean that France won't sign on the dotted line again this week? Well, I mean, first of all, we're discussing uranium and not plutonium. Uh, second of all, yes, all these things are things that need to be discussed. The question is why he insists on having them in the first phase of the interim deal. The point here being that in Geneva a couple of weeks ago, they were discussing the first phase. It was not the end of the negotiation. It was the beginning of the negotiations. Secondly, the notion that uh, the international community will control all of Iran's installations, I'm assuming what is what he's meaning that they should be inspected. All of them are inspected at this point. What Iran needs to do is to sign the additional protocol, which will allow live video feed so that we can monitor what's going on there at the second it's happening. But all these things are things that can be hashed out in the coming phases. So in that sense, I have to say the French position is, is rather obstinate without really any good grounds for it. And, and do you think that the French will budge this week? I think if the United States thinks that there is any danger that this process is about to be permanently derailed because of these uh, slowdowns and, and all of these problems that the French have brought up and created partly, then I would imagine that the United States basically has to decide whether it wants to push the French or not. And will they? I think they should, because if this, if this does not work out, then we're losing uh, momentum and we're losing an opportunity that will perhaps take years again before it arrives, if at all. Because we're dealing now with a situation where, for once, the synchronization on both the US and the Iranian side is to our benefit. That is, that we have people on both sides who want to do business and who are serious and who can deliver. And that happens very, very seldom. Daniel Ben-Simon, what advice would you give the French president going into those talks Wednesday in Geneva? You know, uh, the Iranian issue became uh, the issue in Israel when Netanyahu was elected. I don't remember Ariel Sharon speaking so much, almost obsessively, 
about uh, the existential danger for Israel. I don't remember Ehud Olmert speaking about this. I don't remember Ehud Barak. It's like Rabin. Uh, and I must say, I don't know personally, as an Israeli, as a human being, is it Netanyahu's issue or really it is existential threat to Israel? We don't know. We speak all day about the centrifuge, about the heavy water, about all details of, of nuclear uh, arms. And every kid in Israel will tell you details about how to build a nuclear arm. It's becoming a major issue in Israel. We don't know the truth and, and what is good for, for Israel and for the international community should Iran be totally dismantled of all its nuclear facilities or maybe find a way to keep some of it. Uh, it's really complicated. It's a complex issue. I wish, I wish that uh, the European community and the Americans uh, will understand the Israeli psychology today, which is totally, totally, I mean, sees uh, only in black and white. And for nuclear Iran means the end of Israel. Is it true? I don't know. Uh, 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 Non-nuclear Iran would be a humiliation for Iran. So something has to be done. I tell you, it's beyond me, because in the since Netanyahu became prime minister, it's the one and foremost, uh, the first and foremost issue. It's day. It starts the day with Iran. He ends the day with Iran, and and as I told you, it's we are so, getting tons of words about the Iranian issue. I wish something will be found that will settle. Uh, 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 they will find a settlement between us. Europe and America, and of course with Iran. Daniel, on that point, this Monday, Iran unveiling a new drone capable of flying as high as 25,000 feet over a distance of 2,000 kilometers. Authorities claim it can be used for reconnaissance and combat. Um, this kind of uh, pu very public unveiling, uh, w what does it all say? In Israel, uh, uh, it, it, it's bad news. Uh, Ahmadinejad was bad news for, for, for Iran and for Israel, because this gentleman used to speak all day about putting an end to Israel. This kind of, of psychological war is not enhancing uh, peace. And you have to understand that 40 years ago, Israel and Iran were very friendly. Israelis would go to Iran, Iranians would, would come to Israel in the days of the Shah. And there was a different reality. So, so this kind of drones and military actions and, and verbal uh, 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 provocations from the Iranian government fall on Israelis uh, 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 like, like bombs. You have to change the words. You have to change the language. You have to show some kind of, you know, of, of fairness and of nicety, nicety to, to, to Israelis. You change, you know, and something has to be start from somewhere because the, the way things are today, uh, uh, I don't know. The, the which, has which, something which has to be done, not only in terms of army, but in terms of politics. Which brings us back to which brings us back to the issue of France. And I'll put this to you, Samuel. Why is France towing such a hard line? Well, I think we also have to look at what happened at the, at the end of the summer with, with the Syrian issue. The fact that France was all already at the forefront to intervene against uh, Bashar al-Assad about the chemical weapons. And the fact that we have seen that the United States were changing their positions and that Obama was seen from France maybe as not someone you could rely on. And I think there is also the will for France to show that France is still an important power that can, it can play a card and play, and play a role. And I think this is a very important issue. But the other issue that was mentioned is the que questions when it comes to the Iranians of their national pride is that how can we have a deal that will give the assurance to the Israeli that they don't need to uh, launch a military strike and at mm -hmm. the same time that the Iranians they want to be a regional power so they care about their pride and the question is also the, the struggle of power within but Tehran. There are also, there are also uh, gaps between the way in which the French are talking and the way in which the Israelis see it, because as far as the French are concerned, they will allow 20% of uranium for, to be enriched for peaceful purposes. That's something that certainly doesn't wash with uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. I mean, that's a, a no-go zone. And, and in his speech before the Knesset, François Hollande said that uh, Iran has the right to a civilian nuclear power. That's right. So there, there's clearly there are differences there, but it's not just the Israelis who yes. are very concerned. It's the Saudis as well and other Gulf states in the region who do not like the idea of the Americans going ahead with the help of the Europeans 
in negotiating a deal which they believe is fundamentally flawed, but also, more importantly, changes the power dynamic in that part of the world. The Saudis, and that, that brings us, uh, I want your reaction to this. Writing in the Daily Beast, to Ruzbe Parsi, the Council on Foreign Relations, Leslie Gelb, described an Iran deal as the region's equivalent of ending the Cold War, and he took a big shot at the French, saying, why do you think France has gotten so tough in the nuclear talks? Is there any chance whatsoever Paris actually standing up to the consequences of a war with Iran? Not on your life. More plausibly, Paris is interested in pleasing those very same Saudi autocrats who've now become sanctified by, by buying shiploads of French arms. Is this about money? Well, nothing is ever not about money. Uh, but I, if I could just go back a couple of steps here. I think it's important. I mean, one of the problems with the French position at the moment is that it allows Netanyahu to maintain, and perhaps the Israeli society at large, the delusion that you could have a deal with Iran where nothing remains of a nuclear program in Iran. That is simply impossible. Now, that could have been a negotiation stance in the beginning, but everyone understands within the P5 plus one that the only way of totally removing a nuclear program from Iran is through war and invasion. And no one has the money nor the manpower to do that. So you have to look for a deal that gets you as much as you can, but not that. So in that sense, the French position, even though it differs to some degree from the Israeli, is giving the Israelis the, no, the idea that their position is feasible. And it's not feasible. And the same goes for the Saudis, because the Saudis don't want to deal because they prefer Iran to be caged in. The point is that no one can afford to maintain Iran in a cage forever, particularly since they are continuing to enrich as we speak. So it's not as if they're waiting for us to give them an allowance to enrich. So any kind of deal that can put whatever they have under monitoring, safeguards, and verification is the only way to go. And at some point, the Saudis and the Israelis and everyone else simply has to come to terms with that. And do you agree that uh, this could be the equivalent of ending the Cold War for the region? Well, obviously, it would mean a major shift, because even though at this point, this negotiation is just about the nuclear program, it would inevitably open up the prospects for a more functional non-relationship between the United States and Iran. And by definition, that will change the power dynamics of the region. But that is inevitable. Iran is a big country in this region. I'm not saying that they are you know, entitled to this or that, but the notion that you could keep, the, keep this country in a corner forever without any price tag is simply impossible. Daniel Ben-Simon, uh, if the French do sign on the dotted line to an interim deal this week, will all that goodwill that you described in part one of our discussion towards the French president uh, have a kind of boomerang effect against him? Well, it might have. I must tell you, the compliments he, 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 he got from uh, Israeli politicians in the last two days uh, make this mission, his mission, almost impossible because so much uh, is put on his shoulders uh, about the existential threat. He will have to find uh, the right balance between the Israeli concerns and the, the, the European and American concerns. And, and this is what makes somebody become president, the, the capacity to find the compromise between the uh, concerns of both sides. I, I wish him well, but, but otherwise, uh, all he got in the last two days will be lost, and that would be a pity. Uh, and uh, Daniel, in an interview this Monday with the Financial Times, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's outgoing security advisor uh, warned we have enough to stop the Iranians uh, for a very a long time. Um, he said, we're not bluffing, we're serious, preparing ourselves for the possibility that Israel will have to defend itself by itself. I is that just saber rattling? <laughs> you know, it's a daily talk here that we can do it. Uh, we have polls saying, uh, asking Israelis, are we able to do it? Now, I don't know of many Israelis who know the Israeli Air Force capacity in details, but you have the majority of Israelis saying, yes, of course we will do it. Of course we can do it. It's becoming almost a daily thing uh, in Israeli society, uh, should we talk. But as far as I know, 
uh, the military attack uh, uh, is not taken seriously by the security uh, 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 establishment. It is a serious issue. We know the price of such an attack and the price of, uh, of uh, uh, an attack by Iran. I don't think anybody would dare go that far. But in terms of rhetoric, it's a free market. Everybody says what he wants. Uh, Daniel, isn't the reality, though, that Israel has at the end of the day, limited military capacity in terms of carrying out such attack. It still needs the assistance of Washington and in terms of intelligence, in terms of other facilities and so on. And that, you know, this is all just talk. Uh, Annette, I'm not trying to be modest, but I'm not able to answer this question. It's really, I don't know if Israel has the capacity or not. There are so many uh, views on this coming from uh, uh, army generals, former army generals. I have no idea. The question is not just military, is the wisdom of, of making this question a military one and trying to get rid of the nuclear by, by a military uh, attack. This would be, I think, this is something that should be considered. It's a, I, as I said, it, it has to be a solution has to be found, rather a political solution uh, than a military solution. Ruzbe Parsi, uh, uh, is it really such a narrow window of opportunity as has been described by some? In terms of the negotiations? Yes. Well, I mean, it is narrow in the sense that it is delicate, in that both sides, those who want a negotiated settlement, are sticking out their necks. And there are not enough people with long knives at home, both in Tehran and D.C., would want to see this thing not happen. So obviously it's delicate because they have to be able to come home with something to show for what they're trying to do. And so far, no one has been able to come home with anything because no, so far nothing has been signed. Just one thing regarding the Israeli capacity. The Iranians are not afraid of Israel. Uh, this, most of this talk is bluffing. Israel does not have the military projection power to finish the Iranian nuclear program. Basically what Israel can do is start a war hoping that the United States would be dragged in, but it cannot finish that war itself. And even if the United States comes in, American estimates are that they could at best set back the program a couple of years, at least if it's supposed to be strikes regarding the nuclear program. If it's an all-out war, of course, you can bomb the country back a couple of centuries. But leaving that aside, basically you're talking a deferment of two years, after which obviously Iran will definitely be looking for a nuclear weapon. So the military solution is really not much of a solution. All right, the military solution is not much of a solution. Shamil, what if there is no deal? Well, well, <clears throat> there are two points. First of all, to understand what happens, not only discussion, discussing what we do on uh, is there a threat or not, is it a danger or not. The main question is a fight, which is for centuries, between the Persian culture and the Arabic culture, I mean the Shiites and the Sunnites. If, if you don't consider this main question, you cannot understand what happens in the region. And the attitude of uh, the French uh, government now, of President uh, Hollande, and also of the Quai d'Orsay, which the changed- foreign ministry. The foreign ministry, which changed his attitude, is that the threat of a nuclear uh, power in Iran is a threat not only for not only for Israel, but also for the whole region and also for the world. It could turn into a catastrophe. Therefore, my second point is that I think I think that everything has to be done to avoid the catastrophe, and I think it's possible if the French attitude uh, is adopted by the five of six in, uh, in the negotiation in, uh, in Geneva. Okay, so you're advising... And, and if nobody allows uh, Rouhani to play the game he played 10 years ago when he was successfully negotiating and, uh, and doing what he want, against the, the international interest and opinion. All right, and so Shamia, you're no, no, for one, France. One, you're one for, word. We're, one, we're, we're running out of time. Yeah, well, one, one word, that's it. I think that no Israeli government and no government anywhere can accept gambling... On this issue. On the, on the, we're going, on the nuclear we're, point. We're going to, 
we're going to leave it there. Um, yeah. Uh, we know that you're for staying the course uh, when it comes to the French position. I, I want to thank Samuel Guides Melac. I, I want to thank uh, Daniel Ben Simon for joining us uh, from Jerus Jerusalem. Uh, Ruzbe Parsi for being uh, with us uh, from Lund University in Sweden. And France 24's Annette Young, thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate. It's just not enough.